How were the DRIs and RDAs first created? Um, and should ours on a plant-based diet be any different? Um, since we are talking about uh, different uh, qualities of the nutrients versus animal-based and plant-based, should our um, intake of those nutrients be any different as opposed to a regular standard American diet? Uh, that's a very good question, by the way. Um, and it, it requires some understanding of the history, you know, of RDAs. And so... Uh, I have to go back and tell you that in 1943, 42-43 period, that's when the first RDAs were published. Uh, Jenny at that time, in order to come up with some recommendations for the American soldier, you know, to be healthy, you know, while they're in the service. And so scientists got together at that time and they determined for individual nutrients how much was needed, Okay. And that process got started in 1943 and now has been reviewed uh, every five years since that time by the Food and Nutrition Board, a very distinguished body uh, in the National Academy of Sciences. So every five years, uh, a group of a panel of scientists get together to review those numbers, uh, the recommended dietary allowances for individual nutrients. And they've done that, and of course you see modifications from time to time, depending on new information. But one of the recommendations I find really intriguing and interesting, more than the others, and that is the recommendation for protein. At that time, in, 19, in the early 1940s, the amount of protein that was being recommended was eight-tenths of a milligram per kilogram body weight. Okay. And that was the basis, uh, that was based on experiments actually done in people. And it was done uh, actually to determine how much of this nitrogen-containing nutrient was required in order to compensate for the nitrogen being lost in the urine. So we called it nitrogen balance studies, if you will. And at that time, uh, the studies indicated that the amount of protein that people needed, that's, let's say the adult male, the amount they needed was in the more in the neighborhood of about 0.4 to 0.5 uh, grams per kilogram. Uh, which was really quite low. We're, we're now we're talking down about maybe in the neighborhood of uh, four to five to six percent of total calories. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It was very low, but it, it was an experiment. And so, as all good experimentalists will do, you know, the mean that you get in that and the standard deviation of that number, uh, that standard deviation allows us to know how much variance might be present in the larger population. So, what they did. They took that mean, somewhere around 5-6% of total calories, they took that mean and added two standard deviations to that. Okay. And made a couple other adjustments. Uh, and they finally arrived at a point that was 8 tenths of a gram per kilogram, which is around 9-10% protein. Right. Okay? Yep. What that says statistically, I'm sure that you're aware, when you add two standard deviations like that, in theory, mm -hmm. then we're covering the protein needs, let's say, of about 98% of the total population. Yep. And so that's what it's all about. And so if, on average, if everyone consumed the RDA of, let's say, 9%, 10%, mm -hmm. in theory, that means 98% of the people are going to actually need less than that. Okay. So the real requirement is less than that. The RDA is only just a, a nice, nice, healthy, additional amount to make sure that everybody's covered. I mean, that's the way the argument went. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, since that time, uh, a lot of people think the RDA is the minimum amount we should be required. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's not a requirement, it's a recommendation. The requirement is lower. Now, having made this point, I want to also point out, too, you can ask yourself, which is the healthiest level of protein we should consume? We've done those kind of experiments in the laboratory. Others have done them, not necessarily for the same purpose. But it turns out that in our hands, in experimental cancer, for example, up to, let's say, around 9-10% protein, in the case of the experimental rat, up to about 9-10% of total protein, um, they do not get cancer, even though they've been exposed to a heavy dose of carcinogen. They only get cancer when that level is exceeded. You're going above 10%. And so when you go from like 10% up to 20% or 25%, it's like a dose response, you get more and more cancer the more protein you give. 
And so it turns out the rat and the human requires about the same amount of protein. So this applies to humans. And so then you go back and you say to yourself, or at least I say to myself, okay, 89% protein will be protein, obviously. 89% protein is ideal. We're still in a very good way. We're getting all the protein we need. Mm -hmm. We're not consuming in excess, so we don't have to worry about increasing our cholesterol levels or increasing you know, the hormone that stimulates cancer production, so forth and so on. So we ask ourselves, you know, 8 to 10% protein, that's, that's just about where I want to be. Yeah. Well, it turns out that a whole food plant-based diet, that's what it has. Yep. That's what it has. And see, now, now we're arriving at a point in our, in our argument that comes after, long after, the original uh, research was done on how much protein do we need. When they set that at eight tenths of a gram per kilogram earlier in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, they had no knowledge of how, how, how that might have to relate to cancer or these diseases. They were doing it in what I call a very reductionist way. You know, one nutrient at a time yeah. thing and see what it was. And it has stood the test of time. So now uh, I think we're on really good solid ground yeah. uh, to say that uh, the amount of protein we need is what's present in plants. Plants have all the protein we need. And but what, what have we done as a society? I mean, really about 90% of us, 95% of us are using some kind of animal food. And so that's how we get the average protein in intake up to around 17%, double what we need. It's double what we need, and about 70 to 75 percent of that protein is animal based. And, for, and so, of course, we're asking for trouble. Yep. Because when we do that, then we see cancer risk increases, heart disease risk increases, cholesterol levels start going up early in life, uh, diabetes uh, risk is higher, and so forth and so on. Absolutely. Not just because of the protein, and not just because of the animal based food, but also because of many other nutrients that actually get displaced. You know, as we consume more animal-based foods, we tend to consume less plant-based foods, obviously. Right. And so it's a combination of things, and you put all these things together you know, in one so-called model, then you say, wow, th this is it. This is really what explains uh, why it is that we can actually cure cancer and cure heart disease so quickly. Absolutely. Because we've, we've gotten so far off track in the milk of any mammal, quite yeah. frankly. It's, it's really high in protein. It's a percent of calories. But that's a good deal. Yeah. That's what the body is growing pretty fast. Absolutely. These cells are dividing at a, you know, a rapid pace. And but that's, and so that's the most perfect food Yeah. You know, at that stage in our lives. But beyond that, when you get on the whole food, then everything is, is, is going to be changing.